Hello and welcome to Zoology 142. This is the lecture on the lymphatic system. So here are the learning outcomes for today's lecture. After you complete the lecture, you should be able to list the components in the lymphatic system, describe the anatomy of lymphatic vessels, organs, and lymph nodes, describe the various functions of the lymphatic system, and also identify the patterns of circulation of lymph and lymph components throughout the lymphatic system. Okay, just as an overview, here are some of the major functions of the lymphatic system. Uh, one of the functions is to drain excess interstitial fluid from body tissues and return it to venous circulation. Last lecture we talked about the process of filtration and how that creates some interstitial fluid and we said that most of that interstitial fluid was in fact reabsorbed due to blood colloid osmotic pressure. But in fact, some of that will reside and accumulate within the interstitial spaces and so this excess interstitial fluid needs to be sucked back up by the lymphatic capillaries. Another function of the lymphatic system is to transport lipids and fat soluble vitamins absorbed through the digestive tract back to the bloodstream. And finally, the last and probably most important function of the lymphatic system is it is a site for immune response. That is, it's a site where our lymphocytes can recognize and destroy certain types of antigens and pathogens, and it also become alerted to systemic infections. So we're going to be talking more about immune response and immune surveillance in this lecture and also the lecture on the immune system. Okay, before we start this lecture, we need to go over some vocabulary that's essential to understanding the function of the lymphatic and later on the immune system. So the first of these terms is something called antigen. An antigen is any substance or organism that provokes an immune response. For example, a bacteria might cause an immune response, but also a pollen grain might cause an immune response. So it can be a whole organism or a part of an organism and that organism may be harmful in the case of some bacteria or it may not be harmful in the case of let's say a pollen grain. On the other hand a pathogen is a disease causing microbe that is something that's going to cause illness in the body and so pathogens are recognized as antigens but remember not all antigens are bad but all pathogens certainly are bad and pathogens consist of things like viruses, bacteria, fungi, and protozoa and our immune resistance is the ability to ward off disease through both internal and external defenses. And we'll be talking more about these defenses in the next chapter on the immune system. So here's a simple overview of the components of the lymphatic system. First we're going to have lymph, which is a fluid similar to interstitial fluid. We'll have special vessels called lymphatic vessels that will transport that fluid. And we also have organs called the primary and secondary lymphatic organs. The primary lymphatic organs are things such as the red bone marrow and thymus. And these are areas where our lymphocytes become immunocompetent. And we'll talk about what immunocompetence is in just a few slides. The secondary lymphatic organs, on the other hand, are areas where our B cells and T cells, that is our lymphocytes, will be engaging in battle with potential pathogens. So these are things like the lymph nodes, spleen, and lymphatic nodules. So since this lecture is on the lymphatic system, we should begin with a discussion of what lymph is. Lymph is a clear yellowish liquid derived from interstitial fluid. That is, it's very similar in composition to interstitial fluid. We said before that filtration was a process that actually created some of that interstitial fluid where fluid was forced out of the blood capillaries under hydrostatic pressure created by the heart. We also said that most of that fluid was in fact reabsorbed back into the capillaries due to blood colloid osmotic pressure. But there is some that will accumulate within the interstitial spaces. And so the net difference is around 3 liters per day. That is, we have a little bit more filtration than we do reabsorption. So up to 3 liters a day of lymph can be created in the body. So this diagram just shows a comparison of the three different types of fluids that we've talked about so far. So remember blood is a connective tissue and it's a connective tissue that contains cells such as our erythrocytes and also our leukocytes or white blood cells but it also contains a ground substance or matrix composed of plasma and that plasma contains water, it also contains proteins which are the little green things there and it also contains ions such as the little circles that you see and under the hydrostatic pressure generated by the heart, some of that fluid is going to be forced out of the capillaries and then it will enter interstitial spaces. And remember that these capillaries are porous, but usually not porous enough to let things like blood cells through or very large proteins like albumin through. 
So what ends up as interstitial fluid is usually a little bit of water, some ions, and maybe some very small proteins. And so we do have a net accumulation of interstitial fluid in the body, and one of the functions of the lymphatic vessels is to suck up this interstitial fluid and put it into circulation. So it's called interstitial fluid when it's in between the tissues or in between the cells, and once it's sucked up by the lymphatic capillaries, it now becomes part of lymph. So lymphatic capillaries are the vessels that are going to initially absorb excess interstitial fluid and put it back into lymphatic circulation. And lymphatic capillaries are similar to blood capillaries in that they're composed of a single layer of epithelial cells, but they differ from blood capillaries in that they're quite a bit larger and also quite a bit more permeable. That is, they let a lot more things through. So whereas blood capillaries usually weren't that permeable to proteins, these capillaries here are quite permeable. So any proteins that find themselves in the extracellular spaces can actually move very easily into the lymphatic capillaries. The other thing about lymphatic capillaries is they have one-way valves. The cells that compose the capillary are anchored by fibrous collagen filaments. And so these filaments allow fluid to enter the capillary, but they don't allow fluid to leave the capillary. So this ensures that any excess interstitial fluid will enter the lymphatic capillary but cannot leave. So here you can just see a close-up of the lymphatic capillaries. Remember, we have these overlapping endothelial cells that are anchored by connected tissue filaments. And this enables the capillaries to fill with excess interstitial fluid, but these valves very quickly seal themselves off, let's say, if the pressure inside the capillary becomes greater than the interstitial pressure. So it prevents fluid from going backwards. While we're on the subject of lymphatic capillaries, we should talk about lacteals. Lacteals are specialized lymphatic capillaries that are found within the small intestine. Within the small intestine, we have these small finger-like projections called villi, which are responsible for absorbing nutrients from the food that we eat and eventually putting them in the bloodstream. So things like proteins and carbohydrates are absorbed through the villi epithelium and enter directly into the blood capillaries. Unfortunately, lipids or fats are usually too large to move directly in the blood capillaries. So instead, they're absorbed by the specialized lymphatic capillaries called lacteals. And the lymph that is laden with this fat is called chyle. It's a very sort of white and opaque fluid. So if somebody's eaten a fatty meal and you were to sample their lymphatic fluid, you would see that it was white and opaque because of all the fats that are absorbed into that lymph. So this chyle is lipid-laden lymph that is transported from the lacteals into the other lymphatic vessels, and eventually it's going to enter venous circulation. Now there are a myriad of other lymphatic vessels in the body, and we're not going to go through these in any great detail. Suffice it to say that the larger lymphatic vessels are similar in their anatomy to veins. That is, they have three layers, a tunica externa of connective tissue, a tunica media of a little bit of smooth muscle, and then a tunica intima made up of epithelial cells. And so these lymphatic vessels eventually converge to make what we call lymphatic trunks. These are our major lymphatic vessels. They consist of the jugular trunk, the subclavian trunk, the bronchomediastinal trunk, the lumbar trunk, and not shown here is the intestinal trunk. So all of these are major lymphatic vessels that help to transport that lymph back to venous circulation, and we'll talk about how that happens. So in the last slide, I think I alluded to the fact that this lymph is eventually going to be returned to venous circulation, and the place where that happens is at our lymphatic ducts. So lymphatic ducts are special connections between the lymphatic system and the circulatory system. And we have two different lymphatic ducts, and both of these connect to the left and right subclavian veins. Remember what the word subclavian means. It means below the clavicle. So there are two lymphatic ducts. As you might imagine, the right lymphatic duct unites with the right subclavian vein, whereas the thoracic duct unites with the left subclavian vein. So you might be asking yourself at this point, why do we call one the right lymphatic duct and not call the other one the left lymphatic duct? Well, let me show you. Although both the right lymphatic duct and thoracic duct are approximately equal in size, they don't actually drain similar amounts of the body. For example, the right lymphatic duct drains lymph from the head, the right side of the torso, and also the right arm, whereas the left lymphatic duct 
or more properly, the thoracic duct drains lymph from the left side of the torso, the left arm, and also the entire lower portion of the body. So just like venous blood, lymphatic fluid is under extremely low pressure. That is, the heart is not doing anything to help propel this lymphatic fluid back towards the lymphatic ducts and eventually drain it into the subclavian veins. So how do we get lymph back to the subclavian veins? Well, we do it in a similar way that we got blood back to the heart through venous circulation. First of all, our larger lymphatic vessels have one-way valves similar to veins. In addition, the skeletal muscle pump and respiratory pump also help to circulate lymph back towards the subclavian veins, and both of these were also important in venous circulation. A fourth factor is also important that was not present in venous circulation. That is, the larger lymphatic vessels actually have a small layer of smooth muscle that will rhythmically contract to help force lymph back towards the subclavian veins. And finally, it should be noted that lymphatic vessels and arteries often run very close to one another. And as blood pulses through arteries, their walls will distend and impinge on the walls of adjacent lymphatic vessels. And because these lymphatic vessels are very thin-walled, their walls will be squeezed inward and that will help to propel lymph back towards lymphatic ducts and subclavian veins. So in all, there's actually four or five different ways in which lymph is circulated back into venous circulation. So now that we've talked about lymphatic capillaries and lymphatic vessels, let's look at an overview at the way that lymph is created and how it is circulated through lymphatic capillaries and is eventually returned to venous circulation. First, we're going to start with the process of interstitial fluid formation. Remember that interstitial fluid was formed by the process of filtration in the systemic capillaries. That is, the heart compressed blood which entered arterioles and then entered capillary beds. Some of the fluid in the blood was forced out of the capillaries to become interstitial fluid. Most of the excess interstitial fluid is actually reabsorbed directly by the capillaries. However, any excess interstitial fluid is absorbed by the lymphatic capillaries where it will become lymph. The lymph picked up by lymphatic capillaries will then be circulated through larger vessels called lymphatic vessels. Afferent lymphatic vessels will then transport this lymph towards lymph nodes where the lymph will be filtered. This filtered lymph will leave lymph nodes through efferent vessels and it will eventually re-enter venous circulation through lymphatic ducts which unite with the subclavian veins. So now that we've looked at lymph circulation, let's take a look at the lymphatic organs and tissues. Lymphatic organs and tissues are divided into two categories. The first of these are the primary lymphatic organs, and they consist of the red bone marrow and the thymus. The primary lymphatic organs are the areas where stem cells divide and become immunocompetent. Here we're talking about our lymphocytes, and remember that lymphocytes were specialized types of white blood cells that target specific antigens. And so, basically, the red bone marrow and thymus are kind of like the school for these white blood cells. It's where they learn which cells to attack and which cells not to attack. And that learning process is called immunocompetence. On the other hand, secondary lymphatic organs and tissues are basically the battleground organs. These are the sites where educated T cells and B cells will go out and encounter pathogens and destroy them. And these consist of the lymph nodes, the spleen, the lymphatic nodules, and also the tonsils and Peyer's patches. So again, the secondary lymphatic organs are the areas where most immune responses will occur. Before we go to look at the specific organs of the lymphatic system, we need to talk about two terms that refer to the anatomy of different lymphatic organs. The first of these is the word stroma, and the stroma is basically the tissue that forms the framework of an organ. For example, here you can see a building that's being built, and you can see that the steel girders are basically what's forming the framework or stroma of the building. On the other hand, the parenchyma are the functional parts of an organ. And so, for example, if you're looking at this completed house here, the parenchyma would be all the appliances, the toilets, the sinks, everything that does something in the house. Remember, we have to have a structure or stroma in order to have a place for our parenchyma or our functional parts. Before we go look at lymphoid tissue, let's talk about some of the cells that are going to be present in these tissues. So lymphoid cells consist of immune cells and cells that help to secrete the supporting tissue or stroma. So the parenchyma cells consist of things like the lymphocytes, the macrophages, 
whereas the stroma tissue consists of the reticular cells and to some extent the dendritic cells. We're going to talk about each of these cells in some detail. So probably the most important of these cells are going to be our lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are specialized white blood cells that help protect the body against specific infectious agents. For example, they help us to defend not just against bacteria, but against certain strains of bacteria. When activated, lymphocytes will differentiate into powerful immune cells that will help to eliminate pathogens from the body. There are two types of lymphocytes. The first of these are our B cells. B cells, or B lymphocytes, differentiate into plasma cells which eliminate antigens using protein antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that are secreted by these B cells and they travel throughout the blood plasma and when they come in contact with an antigen or a pathogen they will eliminate it in a variety of ways which we'll talk about in the next chapter. On the other hand T cells are more direct. They are a type of lymphocyte that directly attack and destroy infected cells or cells that are presenting a foreign antigen. So T cells cannot directly identify a free antigen, that is a bacteria floating in the bloodstream, but they can identify it and destroy it once it's infected or bound to one of our own cells. Now it's important to note that unlike the other leukocytes, both B and T lymphocytes have immunological memory. That means once they come in contact with a pathogen or antigen once, they will forever remember that antigen and be able to more effectively respond to it if they come in contact with it a second time. Another type of cell present within lymphoid tissue are the macrophages, and you should be familiar with these already. Remember that macrophages are literally large eating cells. These are generalist phagocytes that will gobble up foreign substances, and they will also help to activate T cells. Another type of cell found in lymphoid tissue are dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are specialized antigen presenting cells. That is, they go out and capture antigens throughout the body and present them to the lymphocytes so that they'll be recognized and can be responded to. So as the name implies, dendritic cells have these long cytoplasmic extensions that can help to ensnare antigens and they will bind to these antigens and then present them to our lymphocytes for recognition and destruction. And finally, the last type of cells found in lymphoid tissue are the reticular cells. Reticular cells are fibroblasts that help to secrete the fibrous connected tissue matrix that composes most of the lymphatic organs. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of a reticular cell, so instead, I'm going to show a picture of a silly puppy. So this picture is an electron micrograph of lymphatic tissue. And so here you can see the various reticular fibers that are secreted by our fibroblast or reticular cells. And sitting on those fibers we have our macrophages, which are important phagocytes, and we also have our lymphocytes hanging out within the lumen of those fibers. And the lymphocytes, remember, are more specific than the macrophages. Whereas the macrophages will eat all different types of bacteria, the lymphocytes are specialized to certain types of bacteria, certain types of viruses, or certain types of infected body cells. So now that we've talked about the different cells that are present in lymphoid tissue, let's talk about lymphoid tissue itself. So most lymphoid tissue is composed of a stroma of reticular connective tissue. And remember, this reticular connective tissue was secreted by our reticular cells. We can find this lymphoid tissue in two different locations. First, we can have diffuse lymphoid tissue. And this is a diffuse tissue found in most loose connective tissues of the body. The only exceptions here are bone and teeth. Bones and teeth do not have lymphatic tissue in them, even though the bones are an important lymphatic organ. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So lymphoid follicles, on the other hand, are concentrations of lymphoid tissue. That is, they are spherical bodies of tightly packed lymphoid cells and reticular fibers. These contain germinal centers which are packed with B cells, which is surrounded by dendritic cells or epithelial cells. And remember, the function of the dendritic cells was actually to grab a hold of antigens and present them to our B cells or T cells. So here's an example of lymphoid tissue. Here we have a lymphoid follicle, and so the follicle is encapsulated by the dendritic cells, and the center of that follicle has our B cells in there. The stroma, or framework, for this follicle is going to be made up of fibrous connective tissue, principally reticular tissue. And you can see there that there's a sinus between the connective tissue and actually the lymphoid tissue, and that sinus will be full of lymphatic fluid.
So the first of our lymphatic organs are our lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are small bean-shaped organs found throughout the body. We have somewhere around 600 in the human body, give or take, and these tend to occur in dense clusters near the mammary glands, in the armpits or axilla, in the groin, and also underneath the jaw or the submandibular area. And the function of lymph nodes is to filter the lymph and also surveil it for any types of antigens or pathogens. And so this is a site of B cell proliferation. That is, it's an area where B cells will rapidly divide once they're exposed to certain types of antigens. And because B cells divide rapidly when they encounter antigens which they recognize, this will cause the lymph nodes to swell and become painful. And so if you go to the doctor's office and you're complaining of malaise and not feeling quite right, a he or she may palpate your lymph nodes, principally the lymph nodes underneath your jaw or your submandibular lymph nodes, and if these lymph nodes are swollen, it can be an indication that an infection is present. So this slide just gives an overview of the distribution of lymph nodes throughout the body. Again, you can see they're especially concentrated in the inguinal region, that is in the groin, and the axillary region, and the armpits, and also in the neck, and also underneath the jaw. Remember that the function of lymph nodes is to filter lymph and surveil it for the presence of any type of pathogens. So now that we've learned about the functions of lymph nodes, let's take a look at the anatomy of lymph nodes. Like most lymphatic organs, lymph nodes are composed of an outer capsule of fibrous connective tissue. And remember, this is reticular tissue, which is laid down by our reticular cells. The inner part of the lymph node is divided into an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The very outer part of this cortex consists of tightly packed follicles of B cells surrounded by dendritic cells. Whereas the inner part of the cortex will consist mainly of T cells, and unlike B cells, T cells will move in and out of the lymph node and continuously cycle between the lymph node, the lymphatic fluid, and the bloodstream. And so T cells are moving around, whereas for the most part, B cells are staying put. So within the lymph node, the lymphoid follicles are surrounded by sinuses. Remember, a sinus is an open area, and this open area is interwoven with that reticular connective tissue and sitting on the connective tissue fibers are our macrophages. Remember that macrophages are generalist phagocytes. They're around to eat anything that comes through there, whether it's an E. coli bacteria or a streptococcus or whatever. So the big picture here is that lymph nodes contain three types of white blood cells. They contain macrophages, which are generalists, and are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, which are very specific in their targets. The B lymphocytes tend to stay put within the germinal follicles, whereas the T lymphocytes can go back and forth between the lymph nodes, the lymphatic fluid, and also the blood. All three of these cells are helping to surveil or inspect our lymphatic fluid for the presence of any pathogenic organisms. And if they find those organisms, they are going to mount an immune response and also alert the other cells of the immune system. And we'll talk about those more in a later lecture. Now that we've learned more about the function of lymph nodes and their external anatomy, we're going to take a look at the circulation of lymph through the lymph node. Remember that one of the major functions of the lymph node was to filter lymph, that is to pull out particulate matter, and also to surveil that lymph for any types of pathogens. So lymph will first enter the lymph nodes through something called the afferent lymphatic vessels. Remember the word afferent means going towards. Once inside the lymph node, the lymph will then flow along the subcapsular sinuses. It will then travel inward towards the medulla via the trabecular sinuses. Remember that trabeculi are little walls or beams composed of fibrous connective tissue. And in this case, these trabeculi are composed of reticular tissue. After it moves deeper into the lymph node, this lymphatic fluid will collect within the medullary sinus. The newly filtered lymph will then exit the lymph node via efferent lymphatic vessels. Remember that E comes after A in the alphabet, and A comes first means going towards, and E means going away. So afferent vessels carry lymph towards the lymph nodes, whereas efferent vessels carry lymph away from the lymph nodes. Now because we have lymphatic vessels throughout the body, it's sometimes possible for cancer cells to spread throughout the lymphatic vessels. 
And so let's say you have a patient that has breast cancer and that tumor's been identified and it's been removed, but you want to know whether or not any of those cancer cells have spread to distant areas of the body. In order to determine that, all you need to do is do a biopsy or sample of the lymph node that drains that particular area. And so this is called a sentinel node biopsy. And if the sentinel node biopsy comes back clean, we know that we've gotten all of cancer and there's a very low chance that it's spread to other areas of the body. On the other hand, if the histopathologist says the sentinel node is cancerous, then we have to worry that those cancer cells might have spread to other areas of the body. So although the lymph nodes are probably the most numerous lymphatic organs in the body, they are not the largest. And so now we're going to talk about some larger lymphatic organs. And these include the tonsils, the thymus, which is located around the heart, the spleen, and also the Peyer's patches found within the intestine, and finally the appendix. All of these are very important lymphatic organs. Now one organ we forgot to talk about in the last slide was the red bone marrow. The red bone marrow, of course, is located within the epiphyses of the long bones. And this is the site of blood cell production as well as our BNT cells, our lymphocytes. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. I thought you said that bone doesn't have any lymphatic vessels. And that's true. So it's not a true lymphatic organ, but it is a site where our lymphocytes are produced. And it's also the site where our B cells or B lymphocytes will undergo the process of immunocompetence. So it's important to realize that red bone marrow is still important for the lymphatic system, even though it's not technically part of it. Another organ that is essential for the immune system is the thymus. The thymus is located above the heart and it's divided into two lobes and it tends to be largest in infants and uh, in very young adolescents and as you go through puberty it actually tends to shrink and get smaller. And the thymus is important because it is the site of immunocompetence for our T lymphocytes. Remember, immunocompetence was a process where T cells were educated. That is, they learned which cells to attack and which cells not to attack. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the thymus. Unlike the other lymphatic tissues, the stroma of the thymus is not composed of reticular tissue. It is, in fact, composed of epithelial tissue, and this sets it apart from all the other lymphatic organs. There are two lobes to the thymus, and each of these lobes is subdivided into something called lobules by trabeculae, or little beams, of this epithelial tissue. Within these lobules, we will find our parenchyma, that is the functional parts of our thymus. And the parenchyma is divided into an outer cortex and an inner medulla. So the cortex of our thymus contains what we call immature T cells, or pre-T cells. These are immune cells that are in the process of going through the special school that T cells go to, learning how to be good T cells and what cells to attack and what cells not to attack. Also within there we have our dendritic cells. Remember dendritic cells were special antigen presenting cells. They literally grab a hold of certain antigens and present them to the T cells. And here we're seeing if T cells can bind to antigens, but we're also making sure that the cells don't wrongly identify self antigens and target them for destruction. The other types of cells in there are epithelial cells. Again, they're part of our stroma and the epithelial cells help to educate the pre-T cells through something called positive selection. Now we said before that the thymus was like a school or boot camp for T lymphocytes, and this is true, but it's a very, very harsh boot camp. In most cases, less than 2% of the T cells will make it through the selection process. The other 98% will be eliminated through a process called apoptosis, or programmed cell death. And the reason these cells are eliminated is because maybe they don't bind to antigens tightly enough. Or maybe they recognize self-tissue and want to target that. In either case, we're going to eliminate both of these cells and only select the cells that can recognize foreign antigens and also can recognize and avoid self-antigens. Also within the cortex, we're going to find some macrophages. Macrophages, remember, are large phagocytotic cells, and in this case, we think they're around just to gobble up all the destroyed T cells, that is, the cells that have undergone cell death. Now, the medulla anatomy is much the same as to the cortex. 
we're going to have more of our pre-T cells. In this case, they're going to be more advanced or further along than the T cells that are in the cortex. We're also going to have dendritic cells, some epithelial cells, and also something called a thymic corpuscle. The function of this thymic corpuscle has been unclear for several years. More recently, we think that this thymic corpuscle contains something called regulatory T cells. And we think that regulatory T cells are important for preventing autoimmune reactions. Think about what the word autoimmune means. It means self-immune. And this happens when your white blood cells attack your own body. And obviously that's not a good thing. And so these regulatory T cells are around, we think, to help prevent autoimmune reactions. And so once they're educated within the thymus, our mature T cells will migrate from the medulla of the thymus and enter the bloodstream to colonize the other lymphatic organs, for example, the lymph nodes, spleen, and other tissues. Our next lymphatic organ is the spleen. The spleen is the largest lymphatic organ in the body. It's located below the stomach on the left-hand side of the body, and its function is to destroy worn-out red blood cells. It's also important for platelet and macrophage storage, and of course it's important for immune response to bloodborne pathogens and also pathogens within the lymphatic tissue of the spleen. And it has a very good blood supply. It is supplied with oxygen-rich blood via the splenic artery and that blood is drained via the splenic vein. Like most lymphatic organs, the spleen is composed of a stroma of reticular connective tissue and this reticular connective tissue forms the outer capsule and also the inner invaginations or little beams going inward called the trabeculae. The parenchyma or functional parts of the spleen consist of the red pulp and the white pulp. The white pulp consists of lymphocytes as well as macrophages. That is, it's the site where both our B and T lymphocytes will reside and proliferate when they encounter infectious agents and it's also the area where macrophages will destroy bloodborne pathogens. Surrounding the white pulp is the red pulp. The red pulp is the area where the old red blood cells will be removed and destroyed and their components recycled. It's also an area where we store platelets or thrombocytes. On average about one-third of your thrombocytes are actually stored in your spleen. The spleen is also important for the production of erythrocytes or red blood cells during fetal life but is not important for production of red blood cells during adolescent or adult life. So the big picture here is that the white pulp contains the white blood cells, that is our B cells, T cells, and macrophages, whereas the red pulp contains our red blood cells that are being destroyed as well as our platelets. So all the lymphatic organs we've talked about so far have a capsule composed of fibrous connective tissue. The remaining organs we're going to talk about do not have a capsule and are associated with the mucosa. Remember, a mucous membrane is any area in a cavity of the body that is lined with mucus producing cells. And so we call these tissues mucosa associated lymphatic tissues, or MALT for short. So these MALT tissues are scattered throughout the connective tissue lining of the mucous membranes. Again, they are not surrounded by a connective tissue capsule but they do have an important immune function. And examples of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue include the tonsils, the appendix, and the Peyer's patch. So here's a question. Why do you think we have lymphatic nodules, or mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, associated with cavities of the body, for example, the pharynx and also the intestine? We'll talk about that in just a few slides. So now let's take a look at the tonsils. The tonsils are the simplest of the lymphoid organs. They form a ring of lymphatic tissue around the pharynx, and they consist of the palatine tonsils, which are found at the posterior part of our oral cavity and back of our soft palate, the lingual tonsils, which are found at the base of the tongue, the pharyngeal tonsils, which are found in the posterior wall of the nasopharynx, and also the tubal tonsils, which are found in the auditory tube around the pharynx. Now, if you remember the question from the last slide was, why do you think we have all this mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue around the oral cavity? And the reason is, it's there to gather and remove pathogens from the inhaled air and also from the food that we eat. Remember that the pharynx is a common pathway for both air coming in and also food coming in. And air can be pretty dirty. It can have bacteria in it, it can have viruses in it, it can have all sorts of things. So it's very important we have these specialized lymphatic tissue there to help eliminate any incoming pathogens. 
Now let's think about food. What's your favorite food? My favorite food is probably a greasy old hamburger, and I definitely like to go to Jack in the Box or any kind of dive place that's around the area. And if you've worked in fast food, you know it's not necessarily the cleanest stuff in the land. Um, and you've probably heard something about the five second rule. The five second rule was basically how long you could leave a hamburger on the ground before you felt so bad that you wouldn't serve it to somebody. And I can tell you I've worked in several restaurants that not only had a five second rule, but on occasion we had a ten second rule. And if you drop that burger on the ground and it stayed there for five or ten seconds, if you were a nice person, you'd maybe throw it back on the grill or throw it in the microwave, give it a little radar love before you served it to that person. But either way, there's a good chance that that burger has a fair amount of bacteria on it. And that bacteria can be very detrimental to your body unless we have a way to eliminate it. And so that's another reason why we have all this mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue around the opening of the mouth and the oropharynx. And we're also going to see that we find similar tissue in the small intestine and also in the appendix. So in case you haven't seen tonsils before, here is a picture showing the tonsils at their location in the back of the pharynx. Now, remember that unlike other types of lymphatic organs, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, which includes tonsils, don't have a connective tissue capsule. So here you can see a histological section of a tonsil, and you see that there are deep crypts or valleys in between the lobes of the tonsil. And these are areas where bacteria and food and particulate matter can get down into the tonsil and potentially start to invade the tonsillar cells. And so this might seem like a very risky proposition. The tonsils are very moist, they're warm, they could definitely incubate bacteria. So why do we leave them so unprotected? So one of the reasons we think that these structures don't have a protective capsule is this allows them to basically cultivate or learn about the bacteria that are in the environment. And tonsils help to educate our T cells and our B cells as to what types of antigens might be around. And so that helps our immune system to better prepare to defend against certain types of pathogens that occur in the environment. So no discussion of tonsils would be complete without talking about tonsillitis. Remember, itis is just a suffix meaning inflammation of. And so tonsillitis is an inflammation of the tonsils. And it can be caused by various reasons. We could have a bacterial infection, a viral infection, or perhaps somebody just snoring too much. Any of these circumstances can cause an inflammation of the tonsils. Most common is that things like strep throat can definitely inflame the tonsils. And back when I was a kid, if you got strep throat so many times in one year, the physician would mark you for a surgery called a tonsillectomy. A tonsillectomy is surgical removal of the tonsils. And we used to do this a whole lot and don't do it so much anymore. Now, we don't do it because tonsils have some essential function. The main reason we don't do it anymore is because removing the tonsils really doesn't seem to reduce the amount of throat infections that somebody gets over their lifetime. And many of these throat infections tend to clear up after somebody moves out of childhood or adolescence. And so a lot of times doctors now don't think a tonsillectomy is worth it. That being said, remember the tonsils are important to cultivate and learn about different types of antigens and bacteria in the environment. And so we don't tend to remove tonsils now unless there's a problem. So you've heard of tonsillectomies before, but you probably haven't heard of something called a tonsil lith. Remember that the suffix lith means stone. So these are literally stone-like structures that are found within the tonsillar fossa. The tonsillar fossa is a deep cavity that surrounds each of the tonsils. And lots of stuff can get stuck back there. Dead white blood cells, old corn chips, mucus, all types of stuff. And this rotting material begins to become calcified because there's calcium in our saliva. And over time, this can create pressure within the tonsillar fossa. And every so often, you might cough up a tonsillith. And tonsilliths smell horrible. They are one of the chief reasons that some people have bad breath or halitosis. And so they tend to be more common in adolescents and young adults and less common in older adults. They don't usually need surgical removal, but in some cases, people with chronic tonsil lists may want to consider a tonsillectomy just so they can get rid of the bad breath. 
Another example of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, or MALT, are the Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are clusters of lymphoid tissue located within the wall of the small intestine, and they are essential in the immune surveillance of pathogens entering the digestive tract. So whatever made it past the tonsils is going to wash down to the stomach and eventually the small intestine. And within the ileum of the small intestine, we find lots of these pyre patches, which contain lots and lots of lymphoid follicles. Now, I should point out that these pyre patches don't go around and eliminate all the bacteria in the digestive tract. That's not true at all. The digestive tract, in fact, has lots of bacteria in it. But the pyre's patches might be important for eliminating the very pathogenic bacteria and maintaining the balance between good bacteria and bad bacteria. And so the last of our mucosa-associated lymphatic tissues are found within the appendix. The appendix, if you remember, is a little finger-like projection found at the beginning of the large intestine, at the area where the large intestine and the small intestine meet. And its activity may be similar to that of the Peyer's patches. That is, it's there to destroy pathogenic bacteria, in particular before they can perforate the intestine and make it into the abdominal cavity. Another function for the appendix may be to serve as a reservoir of beneficial bacteria. Remember, there's not just bad bacteria, but the large intestine and the digestive tract in general also consists of some good bacteria. And during times of gastrointestinal illness, for example, diarrhea, a lot of this good bacteria is washed out of the body. And so this little blind end sac called the appendix might be a reservoir for these beneficial bacteria so that they can repopulate the large intestine once you become well again. So now that we've talked about the different organs of the lymphatic system, let's finish up by talking about some pretty interesting lymphatic disorders. The first of these is elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is a type of edema caused by parasitic worms. Basically, these worms block lymphatic vessels and cause accumulation of fluid in the interstitial spaces, and this is called edema or lymphedema. And these parasitic worms are actually transmitted by mosquitoes. And so, fortunately, it's something that we don't have to worry about here in Hawaii, but it is something that's common in the tropics, for example, Africa, Asia, and South America. So the big picture is that elephantiasis is caused by accumulation of interstitial or lymphatic fluid because their lymphatic vessels are blocked by parasitic worms. Our last lymphatic disorder is lymphoma. Lymphoma is a cancer or neoplasia of lymphatic tissue. Symptoms of lymphoma include swollen but non-painful lymph nodes, fatigue, and sometimes fever. As the name implies, the cancer cells here are derived from immature lymphocytes. There are two different types of lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Both types of lymphoma are treated with chemotherapy, although the prognosis differs markedly between these two forms. To learn more about lymphomas, please visit page 763 of your textbook. You have now reached the end of the lecture on the lymphatic system. Before going on to take this week's Lalima quiz, be sure to complete the sample questions at the end of this lecture. You will not be graded on these questions, however, if you get less than 70% right, I suggest you go back and review the lecture again before going on to take this week's quiz.